We continue our study of Acts. We're in Acts 22. And if you recall last week when we left off our study, Paul was standing on the stairs there in the barracks. The mob was clamoring for him to be delivered to them so that they could kill him. The commander of the uh, Roman cohort was trying to find out who Paul was. Paul spoke to him in the Greek language, which surprised this Roman soldier. He didn't know that Paul could speak Greek. He had him confused for an Egyptian who had led uh, uh, several, uh, or well, about 4,000 men into the wilderness. And Paul identifies himself and wants to speak to the people. And so, the last verse of chapter 21, when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect, saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. Paul was fluent in two languages, in Greek and in Hebrew. He could speak both. And I am, uh, even though I can't prove it, he probably could speak Latin as well. He was that well educated. So he was able to converse among different groups of people, uniquely qualified to be the apostle of the Gentiles as Jesus had chosen him to be. One commentator tells us that the sound of the holy tongue, Hebrew, in that holy place fell like a calm upon the troubled waters. So it just hushes the people even more there in the temple. So he begins in verse 3, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you all are today. He begins by identifying with, his, with the crowd that's clamoring for his death. He says, I'm one of you. I was born in Ray. I was reared in this town. I was born in Tarsus, but I was reared here. And I was educated under Gamaliel. Everyone knew who Gamaliel was. And I'm almost certain a lot of the people in this crowd knew Paul, even though they were clamoring for, his, uh, for him to be put to death. He's given them his bona fides, as it were. He then continues, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting, for, putting both men and women into prisons. He's telling them things that they already knew, but then he adds this. As also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. Interesting that he brings up the fact that the council had given him letters, authorized him to go and do this. My hunch is, even though I can't prove it from an explicit statement of Scripture, from what he says here and what he says in a couple of other places, it seems to me at least that Paul kept those letters. He didn't destroy them. He still had those letters in his possession as his trump card, as it were, in case the high priest and the council said, well, you know, Paul never was one of us. We never sent him on any kind of mission. Paul could then pull out those letters signed by the high priest and the council and say, uh, here it is. So they couldn't say anything against him as far as uh, his story is concerned. He continues, but it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. Now stop for a moment and think about this. Up to this point, remembering what Luke had written in Acts chapter 8 and prior to Acts 8, 
Up to this point, who had Paul been persecuting? The church. And yet Jesus tells him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. When you persecute the church, you persecute the Lord. When you harm the church, you're harming the Lord. It's that personal for Christ. He is the head of the body, the church. And so because of this, Jesus tells Paul, you are persecuting me. He had been putting brethren into prison, been persecuting them to the death. And Jesus says, you're doing it to me. Don't you know that those words still rang in Paul's mind even at this moment? He could still vividly see the Lord as he did that day and he could still hear his voice as it said those words. Those words which changed him uh, forever. Here was a man who thought he was doing right, who just was convinced that he was on the right path and all of a sudden everything's upended. Everything is upended. Verse 9, And those who were with me saw the light to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. Now that clarifies what Luke had written in his account in Acts 9, where he says they did not hear what was being said. It seems to be a contradiction, but it's really not. They heard a voice according to what Paul says, but did not understand it. They couldn't understand the voice of the one who was speaking. They heard something, in other words, but they didn't understand it. But Paul could understand it clearly. Right. In other words, any time that we persecute the church, we persecute the Lord. And that's exactly the principle that's set forth here by Jesus to Paul according to his own testimony. So he says, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus. And there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. Notice what Jesus did not tell Paul. He didn't say, get up because now you are saved. You need to go and preach. That's not what he said. Our religious friends tell us that Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. That we need that experience to be saved just like Paul on the road to Damascus. But that's not correct. Paul was not saved on the road to Damascus. He was saved in the city of Damascus. Jesus told Paul, go into the city and there will be told you what you must do. In no instance of salvation in the New Testament can you ever find an example of a heavenly being or a divine being telling the person what to do to be saved. You can't find it. Now, Jesus gave the Great Commission before he ascended back to the Father in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24. He told the apostles what to preach, yes. But in no instance in the book of Acts can you find an account where a heavenly being told a person what to do to be saved. In the case of the eunuch in Acts 8, what happened? He was told, Philip was told to go and join yourself to the chariot. Why? For the purpose of telling the eunuch what to do to be saved. Paul would put it this way in the book of 2 Corinthians. We have this treasure, the gospel, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. The treasure, the gospel, is preached through earthen or human vessels. And in this case, there was nothing different. The Lord tells Paul to go into the city and so verse 11, but since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. Can't you imagine at this point Paul, what Paul was going through in his mind? Everything he thought that was right has now been upended. Everything that he thought that he was doing, which was according to God's will, has now been shown not to be God's will. Do you not think that his world was completely turned upside down? Obviously it was. Verse 12, a certain Ananias, 
a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up at him. This does not indicate, as we pointed out before, that Saul was a brother in Christ at that moment. No more than when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 when he called the people at Pentecost at the very outset of what he was saying, men and brethren, they weren't brothers in Christ at that moment because he hadn't preached the gospel yet. They were brethren in the sense that they were fellow Jews. He was identifying with his audience. And in this sense, Ananias, remember, was not initially willing to go to speak to Saul because of his reputation. And the Lord persuaded him to do it. So what does Ananias do? He tries to break the ice. Brother Saul, I can almost hear the sort of uh, uh, quiver in his voice, I'm sure, when he says that to him. But then when he sees the pitiful state that Saul's in, he's been fasting and praying for three days, according According to Acts chapter 9, he's blind, he can't see. When he sees Saul for what he, the situation he's in, that gives him more confidence. This man has changed. He's in the process of being changed. Verse 14, he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. And here in verse 16, Paul gives the, his own account of what he was told to do to be saved. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name this is as clear as language could possibly be you would have to have help to misunderstand this and yet so many people have help they have people helping them to say that baptism has nothing at all to do with salvation that you're saved by faith alone without baptism. The baptism is a human work. That baptism has not anything to do with the gospel. And yet what Paul says is clear. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. It's not the water that washes away sins. You know, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the movement of the water has something to do with our salvation. No, it doesn't. The movement of the water has absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. The blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. But how do we contact the blood of Christ? Through baptism. That is through penitent faith, being baptized, immersed, in which we contact the blood of Christ and our sins are then washed away. Yes. Well, the thing is, we've got to always remember that the Lord wants nothing but the best for us. And when he tears down something in our life that's not correct, he's going to build up something in its place, which is the truth. And he says what he says because he loves us and wants us to be saved and wants us to be in fellowship with him. And that's what he desired with Paul. He wanted this man to be his vessel, his instrument. And so... He tells him what to do to be saved through the preacher. That's the only thing he lacked. He already believed in Jesus. He already indicated he was penitent because he was in fasting and prayer. All that was lacking was for him to be baptized and wash away his sins. And that's when his sins were washed away, not before. Our religious neighbors say it happened on the road to Damascus. No, it didn't. It happened when he was baptized. Verse 17, he continues. And notice, please, as we continue this, Paul's making no attempt to defend himself to the mob. Are you catching this? He's making no attempt to defend himself. What's he doing? He's simply preaching. <laughs> He's taking this opportunity to preach the gospel to these people. It happened, he says, when I returned to Jerusalem, was praying in the temple, that I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly. Quickly. 
because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying them. Stephen is still on Paul's mind. The, that one event, Stephen being stoned to death and Paul or Saul holding the coats of those and approving of what they're doing, that still was in his mind. Yes, sir. I've often thought about what was possibly going through Saul's mind on that, on that journey to Damascus. That journey was long enough to cool him down, cool his temper down, and to get him to start thinking. I am certain that even though Paul or Saul was convinced that what they did was right at that time, the stoning of Stephen, it still had to bother him. Seeing that man being beaten to death with huge boulders right in front of him, it still had to have had an effect, even though he thought at the time, that's God's will. The law prescribes it, he would think. But now everything's changed. And I'm sure that, that whatever went through his mind going to Damascus got him ready when the Lord met him. Because as he's going to say later, he lives in all good conscience before God. He was a man that never once violated his conscience, either in Judaism or in Christianity. So the Lord knew what he was doing on this occasion. So Stephen is still on his mind. That event is still with him. And I contend that even at a late stage in his life when he is writing to the, to the young preacher Timothy, that when he mentions that I am the chief of sinners, in other words, he's referring to his life before becoming a Christian, I'm almost certain that Stephen was still on his mind. I'm certain that when Paul uh, passed from this life and went into paradise, that one of the first people he wanted to talk to was Stephen. I'm almost certain of that. I can't prove it, but just in my mind I can see it happen. Saul, or Paul, finding Stephen in paradise to, to meet him and, and uh, embrace him and, and uh, talk with him for a good while. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. The thing is, we often talk about forgive and forget. Well, there's a re very real sense in which you can't forget certain things that happened to you or certain things that you did. Uh, before you became a Christian, can you remember things that you did that were wrong? Of course you can, of course. Memory stays with us. But as Steve just pointed out, you put those things behind you. You put them where they belong in the past. That's where they belong. They don't define who you are now. Uh, they don't control you. That's who you used to be. 
Now you press on. You press on toward the mark of the prize, the high calling of God. You are now forgiven. You are now redeemed by the blood of Christ. You now can go forward knowing that the Lord will forgive you when you do make a mistake, when you do transgress. The Lord is there for you where he wasn't before. So that was the difference with Paul. All the things that he had done previously, as evidenced by what he writes to Timothy, he remembers. He remembers everything he did. But he doesn't obsess over it. He doesn't dwell on it. He doesn't continue in it. That's in the past. He's sorry for it. He's been redeemed. And now he moves on. He moves forward. And I'm sure that when Saul went to paradise, not only did he seek out Stephen, but he also sought out the brothers and sisters whom he had thrown into prison and whom he had caused to blaspheme. The ones who received forgiveness for it, that is. The ones that he had beaten, had put to death. I'm certain that, saw, that Paul sought those people out in paradise. Yes, sir. Right. Absolutely. And that's something to think about. No matter how heinous and how awful something can be in someone's life, a person can receive forgiveness if they decide to change their life and obey the gospel. No matter who it is. If Nebuchadnezzar could change and become a worshiper of the one true God before his death, Anybody can change. If Saul, who had persecuted the church to the death and caused brothers and sisters to blaspheme and agreed with the killing of Stephen, if he could change and he could obey the gospel, anybody, anybody can change. And that gives me hope. And I'm hoping it gives everybody in this room hope. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, the Lord wants you to have fellowship with him. Yes, sir. Well, thing is, Paul preached the truth, and Paul wanted all people to be to be. He wanted all people to be saved. And, yeah, God. Yes. Yeah. Well, Paul. Paul preached the truth. Paul wanted all people to be saved and come to knowledge of truth, as God did, and that's what we need as well. So we continue. Uh, he, verse 21, he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They listened to him up to this statement. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. Notice, the King James says they listened to him up to this word. I believe the King James specifies it better. What was that word? Gentiles. When he mentioned Gentiles, that started the mob up again. Can you imagine the prejudice, the deep-seated prejudice of this group that when you simply mention the word Gentiles, it starts their blood boiling and they start just going crazy? Well, that's exactly what's happening. Verse 23, as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air. Have you ever seen anything like this on the news? Oh, yeah. If you've seen any news reports over the last 15 to 20 years coming from overseas, you've seen mob situations similar to this on occasion where they start throwing dust into the air and it just looks chaotic. 
This is what's going on here. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. Get this picture. The commander has no clue who Paul is. So what is he going to do? We're going to examine him by scourging. What? They're going to beat the truth out of him, in other words. Notice, but when they stretched him out with thongs, what were they doing specifically? They bent Paul forward on a reclining post, stretched him out, and tied him up to it. They were about to take that flag room and start beating him to try to get the truth out of him. But Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Again, Paul draws on his citizenship to get him out of this situation. The commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, but I was actually born a citizen. Paul was born in Tarsus. People born in certain cities of the Roman Empire are free Roman citizens by birth. They have all the rights and privileges of it. I'm reading a book right now called SPQR, about the history of Rome. Excellent modern history of the Roman Empire. Very well written, very clearly written, easy to read. Uh, I'm about halfway through it right now. Talking about the citizenship practices of the Roman Empire, how it developed from an early stage up to the first and second, third centuries. It's interesting to see how that process developed. Who is a Roman? What is the process of becoming a Roman? Uh, what kind of rights and privileges should, be, should we grant to individuals? It evolved. It evolved over a period of decades. To the point where you come to the first century, you have it in place, the certain cities of the Roman Empire in which you're born, you are a Roman citizen, free and clear. That's what Paul was. He relies on it. And you could buy your citizenship too. As this centurion says, he says, with a large sum of money, I purchased my citizenship. Yeah, that's true. You could do that. Not Paul. He was free born. Therefore, those who are about to examine him immediately let go of him. And when he says this, you can just see him just start walking back. You know, oh, we're, not, we're not doing this. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman. And because he had put him in chains. I think a more appropriate word to use on translating that word afraid is terrified. The Roman commander was terrified. Why? Roman law stated that if you bound a free Roman citizen who is not condemned, who is not, uh, not guilty of any kind of crime, and you especially when you beat that citizen, you would be put to death yourself, no matter who you are. So that Roman centurion knew exactly the consequences of what he was about to do. And everybody else around him knew that. That's the reason why, boy, they just let him go. We're not going to have anything to do with this. We're not going to touch him. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, the Roman centurion still had absolutely no idea. Why is Paul being condemned like this? Why did they want him killed? He still had no clue. He released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. So now picture the scene. Paul is now before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin assembles. Now some commentators say this was not an official assembly of the Sanhedrin. I don't buy that. I think this was an official assembly of the Sanhedrin even though uh, the... Uh, the uh, centurion orders this assembly. I still believe this is a lawful assembly of the Sanhedrin. So Paul, looking intently at the council, that is the Sanhedrin, said, brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Think about that for a minute. 
Can we say that? Can we truly say that we have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day? Paul could. Remember what the Lord told Paul on the, Saul on the road to Damascus? He says, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks or kick against the goads. What did that mean? The Lord knew that it was difficult for Saul to go against what he thought was right. In fact, he couldn't go against what he thought was right. He never violated his conscience when he was in Judaism, and he never violated his conscience when he was in Christianity. Why? What was the difference? The difference was he had been taught right when he heard the gospel and when he obeyed the gospel. That's the difference. The conscience is something that we can rely on to a point. Some people say, let your conscience be your guide. Well, to an extent. The conscience is there to guard us against doing things that we know are wrong. But the conscience can be misled. If we allow our conscience to be our guide in everything, then we're going to be led astray. But our conscience, when properly trained by the truth, by the gospel, can guide us in the sense of warning us when something we're about to come upon or something we're thinking about doing, our conscience can say, no, you know that's not right. It's that inner voice. Everybody has an inner voice. Yes, sir. Right. That famous philosopher, Jiminy Cricket. Yes, he did. He absolutely did. Uh, the conscience is something that we can't ignore. Uh, some people, I think, this is my personal th thinking. I believe that when some people say that, you know, they're hearing voices, that it's their conscience. Because our conscience is a voice that we can definitely hear within us. But the question is whether that conscience is trained properly. Paul's conscience had not been trained properly prior to becoming a Christian. He was thinking he was doing God's will. But after he obeyed the truth and learned the truth and was completely uh, taught the truth, his conscience still did not lead him astray. And he could say that at this point. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Have you ever been hit in the mouth? It's not fun. <laughs> and if you have suffered that, you know how upsetting it can be. Here Paul is bound. He says this and all of a sudden the high priest says strike him. But punch him in the mouth. You can see the blood coming from Paul's mouth, I'm sure. Uh, that's something. Yes, sir? I don't know if that had anything to do with this. It's just the fact that the high priest didn't want to hear what Paul said. And Ananias, if we know anything about Ananias, and by the way, <clears throat> I refer you to Burton Kaufman's commentaries. Uh, you, can, uh, you can access Kaufman's commentaries online through studylight.org, both Old and New Testament. Brother Burton Kaufman was a faithful gospel preacher for many, many years, and his commentaries were first issued in print form, and now they're online. You can access his full commentary set. In his commentary on Acts 23, talking about Ananias, he says, according to his study, that Ananias was one of the most reprehensible figures to ever occupy the office of high priest. That's across the board. People agree with this. Josephus talks about it in his antiquities. Uh, in fact, there was one, one person he cites that says that actually a man named Jonathan should have been sitting as high priest, which explains, I believe, what Paul says next to an extent. But this man, Ananias, well, if you, if you read anything about him, you, he was something else, and it's not saying that in a good way. So, verse 3, Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? God is going to strike you, he says. That would happen. Right at the outset of the Jewish war that happened in Jerusalem that culminated with the destruction of the temple in AD 70, right at the outset of that, Ananias himself was murdered by his own people. 
he was struck down. God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. It actually happened. But the bystander said, do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. He's quoting Exodus 22, 28, but I can't help but chuckle when I read that. I am convinced that Paul was saying that sarcastically. <laughs> Some people say, well, he didn't really, couldn't see because of his eyesight problems. He couldn't tell whether that was a high priest. Uh, I think Paul knew. And I'm sure Paul knew the character of Ananias. And so when he says, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest. <laughs> He's saying out loud what a lot of people in that room were thinking already. This guy's really not high priest. <laughs> because the law, Exodus twenty two twenty eight says, you will not speak evil of the ruler of your people. He's telling them in a not so subtle way, I wouldn't say that to the real high priest. <laughs> but yet, I can say that to this guy. Now there's some, Kaufman doesn't agree with that. He doesn't think that Paul's using sarcasm here. I do. I believe he is being sarcastic to make a point to the people that are there and also to start the process of what's about to happen. Verse 6. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. Paul knew his audience. <laughs> he knew to get them uh, away from him and get them to fuss with each other, he knew exactly the question to bring up. As he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees and the assembly was divided. This was a stroke of genius on Paul's part. He knew exactly how to get the attention away from him. Luke explains, verse, verse 8, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. When we talked about the intertestamental period on Wednesday night Bible study sometime back, we talked about how the Pharisees and the Sadducees split and the reasons for it and uh, the philosophies behind both sects. And so Luke is simply summarizing here uh, what's behind this division, this dissension. And there occurred a great uproar. And some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up again to argue heatedly, saying, we find nothing wrong with this man. <laughs> Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. Uh, it had the desired effect. Some of these people uh, in the council were more upset with Ananias than they were with Paul. Paul knew that, I'm convinced. And he used that knowledge to set the stage to lay the groundwork for what he did with this question. And so these Pharisees jump on it to try to get at the high priest. And of course it redounded well for Paul. Yes, sir. Oh yeah. They're trying to get the, they're trying to jockey for power. The, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees couldn't stand each other. And that's why it's all the more remarkable in Matthew 22 when they buy, ba band up together against Jesus. You know, it's like politics makes strange bedfellows where you got the Pharisees and Sadducees that normally don't agree on hardly anything at all. They come together to try to discredit Jesus. Well, here, Paul uses that same dissension that he's fully aware of, well familiar with, to exploit this division within the council and come back in, in favor of him. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Paul knew that he had that Roman cohort of soldiers that would protect him. And that's exactly what happened. He knew, apparently Paul did, that this centurion had a good character. That he would do what was right, and that's exactly what took place. It comes in before this thing gets out of hand, before Paul can get harmed, and carries him out. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, 
For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. This came at exactly the right time for Paul. It seems, because of what the Lord says to him here, that Paul may have been despairing. Will I ever see Rome? Will I ever get to Rome? Remember what he had said to the brethren at Rome in the last chapter of his epistle. His intent was to go to Rome. He's already said that his intent was to go to Rome in the book of Acts. He's told them that as well. Now here he is, you know, caught up in Jerusalem. Everybody's wanting to kill him. Will I ever get there? And the Lord says, yes. You will be my witness at Rome. That had to have given him great courage and given him strength to be able to press on. And that's exactly what he would need. Uh, next Sunday morning when we continue our study, this thing hadn't ended up yet. He's not out of the woods as it were. And uh, he's going to have to deal with a far more serious conspiracy that's about to develop. That's what